Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great honor to be asked to, to, to launch this series of lectures. I'm really looking forward to the others uh, because I'm aware of the, the varied work that's been done. I myself have been working on Dunfermline projects for a, a few years now, and I'm actually, I'm almost embarrassed to say this is my first public opportunity to say thank you to a number of people associated with the Abbey Church uh, for admitting me to, to do that research and for helping me in that. If nothing, the most important thing that's come out of what I've done since about 2007 has been local knowledge and actually making sure you visit the site, you visit the place. It's wonderful to be able to give a lecture on this topic in situ, try and catch some of the atmosphere and to be able to point to some of the locations that I'm actually going to be talking about. We also have a cast of the Bruce Skull and of course Ian Fraser's wonderful recreation of the lost tomb to consult as well. But I'd really like to thank Francis McCafferty, David Williams, Ken Richards, Arnott Wilson, who first invited me in, uh, Reverend Mary Ann Rainey, uh, Mary Walsh, and Willie, is he here today? No? No? Dash. <laughs> Above all, for their many kindnesses, but also for what they've been telling me about the site, keeping me right on various things, uh, and actually making sure I go and look, as well as question the written evidence. Uh, really, that's, that's what a good historian should do. I've got a second lecture to give uh, on other work I've been doing involving ground probing radar. I'll save my other thank yous for then to various other members of the, the Dunfermline Heritage Partnership, which is doing such great work just now. But in speaking to this, the discovery and the reinterment of the bones, I also want to thank the archivists uh, whose collections I consulted uh, and I'm still going back to uh, for my research. Not least Dunfermline, uh, the Carnegie Library and Gallery and its holdings, what used to be the local history centre when I first started. Uh, the Elgin Archive at Broome Hall and the Blair Ar Adam Archive just up the road, 10 or so miles near to Kinross. Uh, there's gold in them, their archives, ladies and gents. A fascinating story told through council and church minutes, letters, newspapers, antiquarian studies and books. And I hope to try and bring some of that out today in relation to the discovery and then the reinterment. Uh, bearing in mind that some local historians have written about this already at great length, for example, Henderson's Annals of 1879, and before that, Reverend Peter Chalmers, who was the minister of the second and first charge here in the Abbey Church uh, in his expanded statistical account, which he publishes in the mid 19th century. Uh, they have lots of narrative detail that you can go and consult. I'm going to take a slightly different angle, trying to bring out what is a unique story, unique to Dunfermline, but also to try and persuade you that what goes on around the discovery and the reinterment, the tensions, if you like, is very much a snapshot of Scottish history in microcosm, as Dunfermline very often is, I think, across many centuries. Must remember, I've got to change the slides myself. Uh, always forget, just rattle on. Now, having studied things uh, since about 2007 to do with this discovery and reinterment, I am very conscious. It does feel very poignant to be here on the same day 200 years since. A very remarkable ceremony took place. It was a Friday in 1819. No clue as to what the weather was, whether it was cold, wet, what have you. It might not seem the best day for what is actually an open air ceremony. The walls of the new Abbey Church had only reached about seven feet high. It's a ceremony organized by the Deputy Royal Remembrancer, Henry Jardin, to whom we owe these wonderful drawings of the skeleton in its lead shroud and the physical features of the skeleton. He wrote and published a report for the antiquaries. And it's a ceremony attended by a delegation of Edinburgh uh, dignitaries, representatives of the barons of Exchequer, who are paying for part of the new church and what goes on with the bones. Only part, we should note. They're joined by local worthies, uh, local leaders of council and church, to inspect the remains and to reinter them. Some 18 months after they'd first been discovered. So we have to go back to the 17th of February, 1818, uh, which I know was a day the Abbey Church also commemorated last year in a wonderful series of events. On that day, workmen clearing the centre uh, of the ruined choir site come across, as I'm sure many of you know, the two broken slabs some with rings so they can be removed. That seems to have been done, and a lead skeleton 
is observed, shrouded in what looks like a polished uh, stone uh, interment space, a small crypt. Uh, the drawing does rather exaggerate its size, I think. Peering through the gap in the lead, it seems, or perhaps peeling some of it back, they're already observing a cut sternum, uh, a damaged skull, and perhaps, the reports here, either a lead coronet around the head or a coronet made up of cloth of gold bound around the head and then down over the rest of the body. The reports differ there. It's rather the position of the discovery, the crypt and the skeleton, in the middle of the choir, as the 14th century chroniclers put it, that seems to confirm with that physical evidence that this is Robert Bruce. According to Ebenezer Henderson, for months it was the all-absorbing talk in town and elsewhere in the country. Newspapers, fly sheets, broadsheets, even penny prints abound circulating this news. And it reaches Edinburgh and London, as we might expect, and makes it into their newspapers, and indeed into the discussions of the authorities. And that's where, for me, it really begins to get interesting. I don't think the, the pride and the excitement of the locals of Dunfermline is at all in doubt. Henderson is right. It's rather how the authorities, both in Dunfermline but also elsewhere, begin to wonder, well, how do we handle the discovery of these bones? So what is quite a delicate moment in the British Isles in Scotland. And in exploring how they, 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 they rather stutter and become quite nervous over it. This is what I say about it, it revealing something about the state of Scotland at this time. It isn't actually for historic or antiquarian reasons that the site is being cleared, as I'm sure many of you know. That said, it's clear right from the start of the, the work on the, the new Abbey Church site that the authorities, the locals, expect royal remains to be found. It's perhaps more uh, present in their consciousness because less than a year before, March 1817, in our broth, workmen clearing that ruined choir had found what's believed to be in red here the grave and some of the bones of its founder, William I, King William the Lion, uh, in an abbey dedicated to St. Thomas Becket, uh, right in the middle of the, the monk's choir, just, just beyond the crossing. Uh, not directly close to the high altar, but an effigy of frosterly marble, supposedly the same stone used here for royal monuments and perhaps trimming the liturgical area, uh, is also found, although closer to the high altar. So antiquarian thoughts are perhaps present, but it's to the antiquarians, those few that do come and have a look at Dunfermline, the early days of antiquarian studies and calls for conservation, uh, and in particular to just a handful of 18th century drawings of the ruined choir next to the nave, which of course has persisted as the parish church. Uh, it's to these that we owe what little we do know of that ruined site. Uh, as you can see, really on the, the eve of uh, the building of the new Abbey Church, just four of the arched windows of what's probably the Lady Chapel are standing uh, along with a couple of bits of pillar. Uh, really beyond that, as you'll see, it's uh, foundation walls that might be all that's left and some tomb fragments, as we'll note. The Reformation, of course, had seen the choir devastated, iconoclasm takes part, where we've got no real details about just how bad the damage is. Within a generation, the roof is in, we're told, although there may still be monks there to protect some of the tombs. Uh, but clearly, in the 250 years which follow, which more and more I'm beginning to come to think, this is the crucial period to understand, and it's so hard to actually understand it. You have to assume that just as with many other great churches surrounded by busy local people, the stone gets recycled, it's worked into the town. Curious people come for a hauk, uh, as some of the locals describe the antiquarians. Uh, on other occasions, there's actual occupation of the site. Cromwellian troops probably stay here in the 1650s. We don't really know what they may have done. Uh, and there may be earlier burials by local people within the ruined confines, which they quickly, in the 18th century, start to define with a wall and separate it from the northern graveyard. Uh, so burials which precede the more formal period of what's known as the Salter churchyard, uh, when more elite figures are buried in this space. There are numerous collapses of the medieval structure, four major ones, the last in 1807, 
which actually sees the, the West Tower collapse, very sadly killing five horses. Uh, when these tend to happen, the cut stone is apparently deposited in the ruinous East End, where they have public routes, auctions of the cut stone. It's a very powerful image for me of the sort of hard-headed stonemasons of West Fife standing in this ruined space, bidding on bits of stone. And who's to say they don't go beyond what's fallen? It's all oh, of that too, thank you very much. Uh, so really recycling the site. Now you might be shocked by that. I would refer you to the example of Reading Abbey, where there's a, similarly a, currently a big project underway to try and recreate and locate burials and so on. The degree to which the stones of Reading Abbey, another great Benedictine church, are reworked into the town uh, is, is really being realized there. And I think you'd have to expect something similar goes on here. Now, second half of the 18th century very definitely sees the ruined space of the choir, increasingly defined by walls, uh, being used as this Psalter churchyard. So I don't want to overemphasize the word elite, but certainly people are paying for the prestige of being buried within this royal space. Uh, we certainly know of Bruce of Elgin family monuments over in the northeast corner, perhaps further down in the middle of the choir as well ministers and their families, wealthy merchants and so on, most of which are removed between 1816 and 1818, some out to the back space where they are fenced off still. Uh, the Elgin monuments, of course, removed to the south transept of the new Abbey Church. But that means that just before they start building the Abbey Church, this is a very mixed space. According to Chalmers and his statistical account, it's a mixture of rubble, rubbish, some three or four feet deep in spaces, but also much more kempt and cultivated areas where people have cleared spaces for these Salter churchyard graves. And it's actually in the digging of some of these graves that we get more possibly medieval finds. In the 1770s, there's reports of, again, in the northeast corner under the, under the, the organ now, uh, of what they take to be an elite female burial from the medieval period. Long hair is reported which they take to be Queen Elizabeth de Burr, possibly, although there's some, again, confusion in the antiquarian sources there. You also have, uh, as it were, official antiquarian visits. Some of you may know, in 1807, John Diel, an antiquarian from Edinburgh, comes uh, and undertakes fairly hasty excavations. He doesn't record them by any means under the sort of modern archeological standards we would hope for. Uh, and he's later denounced by locals and others for having hauked, just dug away. He's looking, though, under the six traditional slabs, really in the entranceway of what used to be the, uh, the gift shop as you came through uh, from the north door. The local tradition being that six kings are buried under these, the six slabs, and the biggest of these, nine feet long, is likely Bruce. Burns, Robert Burns, comes in 1787, and goes down on his knees and kisses that stone, just as he also goes to Bannockburn, following a sort of pilgrimage route of Bruce's achievements. Uh, it's interesting, however, that when Dial digs it up, he only finds one grave underneath the join between the two biggest stones, a stone coffin about five feet down, filled with broken and waterlogged bones, very waterlogged, very ruined, so no decisive conclusions, although he does record digging to the southwest, so more into the middle, roughly where maybe Francis is sitting, uh, perhaps, uh, and records that there was a belief at that time that that's where Robert Bruce's tomb may have been as well. And indeed, he reports finding pieces of white and gilded marble there. It's worthy of note, and I might return to that in my second lecture. So there's a strong antiquarian current, and there are bits and pieces of evidence popping up of what was there when the workmen claimed to clear the site, and the, the architect builder will move in. There's also a visit in 1790. This is a wonderful source I only just really became aware of this summer. Uh, another Edinburgh visitor, a, a surveyor this time, uh, John Bain, comes and paces out what he sees as a medieval remains. And Henderson is certainly aware of this, and he uh, tries to work them up, as does Erskine Beveridge, as sketches later on. Uh, and in particular, that pillar points to something much more substantial, perhaps a springer about there, launching out into quite an open space for the Lady Chapel uh, over to the north. 
And of course, the four great windows still remain at this point. It is, though, for practical reasons that the workmen have been sent in in 1818 to expand the fabric of the church for a growing congregation. And by 1817, 1818, the Kirk Session has already put in an application to uh, the church extension scheme, which the government is running, has extended to Scotland. Uh, well over 1.5 million pounds made available by the state. They see this as an important investment in, if you like, Protestant national identity to help expand uh, suitable churches for the growing urban populations of their kingdom. Uh, now, uh, this is rather a fanciful rendering. It's not Dunfermline, don't panic. Uh, but this idea of overcrowded pews and lofts within a structure that's really beginning to, to, to struggle to be maintained it is essentially medieval with an early modern wooden core. Uh, it, it's what's happening at Dunfermline. Another antiquarian, John Syme, uh, another churchman antiquarian, uh, whom we should note lived later than 1818. Really, that's when his antiquarian career takes off. And he may be relying on other people's visits and very early memories of his own about what was there. The historic environment Scotland retain his fabulous drawings of just how messy and crowded the interior of the nave had become, how difficult it was to conduct services, and not really in keeping with the dignity of what had been a royal borough of a growing population. Population of the parish has reached almost 12,000. Population of the borough itself is well over 6,000. And the congregation of the Church of Scotland Abbey Church is about 1,400 and growing at this point. There are, of course, many several dissenting churches in, Stirling, uh, in Dunfermline as well. Now, Syme, and I'll just, just drop this in, uh, also records, as well as quite a detailed rendering of the pews and lofts and so on, he also attempts to recreate after the fact, well after 1818, the choir, what was cleared in 1818. Uh, and you can see the problems of dealing with these kind of antiquarian sources. There are errors here. He's relying on memory. He misaligns the Bruce tomb and the Margaret tomb. He has Bruce too far over. Nonetheless, he is trying to suggest a much more symmetrical shape than we often think or assign to Dunfermline. Uh, Very often we flatten this side and only have a large Lady Chapel extension to the northeast. He is also suggesting quite an array of steps, potentially, and other what look like either crypt spaces uh, or closed off areas for Salter churchyard burials. He seems, though, to have the six slabs too far west. Uh, so you can see the degree to which he's relying on memory, and it, it's not accurate. Syme was the same. Uh, his source is, is not altogether trustworthy. Nor is DL's, but at least DL perhaps more accurately places the six key slabs. Now, the real reason for extending the church and going for the plan that was decided upon of rebuilding on the site of the ruined choir uh, clearly falls to Thomas Bruce, seventh Earl uh, of Elgin. He wasn't, his wasn't the only view amongst the church heritors within the Kirk session. Uh, there seems to be a strong body uh, of men who were more interested in simply restoring the nave they have it costed, they even have an architectural plan. It would cost about 4,000 pounds simply to do that work. Whereas the idea of building a new church, either to the south or directly on the choir's footprint, is double that, at least 8,300. And indeed, the costs will rise beyond that. It's interesting, though, that it's clearly Elgin's leadership within the Kirk Session that sees Memoranda written, first of all, to the barons of Exchequer, who are the Crown's representatives who will pay for this, asking for a state contribution towards that £8,300. And when Bruce's grave is discovered, it's Elgin who organises an additional letter asking for more funds from the state because there are now national interests, as he puts it, at stake. And there is great interest in seeing just how this church will commemorate the hero king. He clearly takes that lead. I think it, it's easy to be cynical about Elgin's involvement and his motives here. Uh, he'd returned to Dunfermline 
around about 1806 from a period of exile and arrest in France. He has considerable debts. He's only just managed to negotiate uh, the sale of the Elgin Marbles to the British Museum around about 1816. And yes, certainly a number of people have accused him of wanting to do something quite public, playing on his connections as a descendant of Bruce and as chief editor of the Abbey Church, uh, of the Abbey Church Kirk Session, to restore his reputation. He'd also gone through a very public divorce, uh, and his health is very often the source of public ridicule by luminaries as, as, as well known as people like Lord Byron. He really has a hard time, if you like, in the public court. But I think that's too easy a, a, a route to take. And very often when people do that, even people as distinguished as Sir Walter Scott, they're being, I think, unnecessarily unkind. He clearly had a strong sense of duty as chief heritor, not from the most ancient line of heritors, uh, but chief in terms of financial responsibility. And he wants to do his duty by Bruce. But more than that, I think we shouldn't overlook his antiquarian principles. For all that the Elgin Marbles controversy was that, it was something of a scandal. He does push very hard on this idea of a need to serve, to report, to preserve these things. And we know that once Bruce's remains have been discovered and there's discussion about what to do, he takes it upon himself to write to the Secretary of State, Viscount Sidmouth, calling for a delay in the clearing of the site and the building work until all as he puts all the royal graves can be identified, not just Bruce's. He wants to ensure above all that they're all embraced within the new walls uh, of the new Abbey Church. And later on, he will even write a general appeal to the state about the principle of the state stepping in to take care of historic buildings. So I think we shouldn't overlook that and simply go for his more personal reasons. There's a complexity of reasons here. And I think Scott is being very unkind. He reports Walter Scott in his journal running into Elgin, whom he says, I don't really know, uh, in Edinburgh, I think in late February 1818, when the Earl is apparently all a Twitter with something to do with Bruce's tomb. Uh, and Scott pokes fun at him. Uh, and it's quite dismissive uh, of what he's doing. I think that's a mistake. It is Elgin who brings in the architect builder. Will you so just as the restoration of the nave crew have their own plan and builder, he brings in Byrne. Now, Burn at this time is really at the beginnings of his career. He's only just making a reputation for himself in building very distinguished, large-scale new Presbyterian churches in Edinburgh, very often with a Gothic flavor, a sort of medieval flavor to them. And he'll go on to make his name as a, an architect builder to the aristocracy in terms of manor houses and mansions, but also ecclesiastical architecture. Uh, Hess have his Royal Commission collection of plans, about a dozen or so, uh, colored drawings, his proposed, his tender, if you like, for the Abbey Church. They don't tell us a great deal in many senses. They're beautiful, uh, but he's an architect builder. There was undoubtedly a working set of plans, and he's on site with his chief, chief builder, John Bonner, and others, working with the problems that he encounters. And as we'll see, it's quite a, a difficult site. This is probably where I should apologize to the memory of uh, William Byrne. I felt quite bad about this off and on. Uh, by all accounts, through his career, he establishes a reputation as being an honest, principled individual, always delivers on time if he can, to cost, etc. Uh, he goes on later on to fund such antiquarian interests as Billings' famous four-volume set of ecclesiastical and baronial architecture. He's kind of a silent partner in that venture. So he's an antiquarian too. But I did begin to wonder if, under the pressures of patronage, and in dealing with a very difficult site, it slopes from north to south. It tends to flood on this site. Uh, and indeed, something Ilgen does rather creates a difficulty for the flooding issue. Faced with those issues and a time scale which is quite demanding and a budget which ideally the heritors don't want to grow, I, want, I began to wonder if, does he barrel through some of the medieval remains over and above the ones he reports? Now that would be a bit unfair, and we are, after all, I really can't exaggerate how indebted we are to this plan, which is the one he draws up, it then goes into Jardin's report as Lord Remembrancer, Deputy Remembrancer, and it will then be used by Peter Chalmers in his expanded statistical account. In black, you have the new Abbey Church footprint, complete with vestry, but underneath, in grey, are the medieval walls 
as Byrne reports they are visible in 1818. He also marks as L, the Bruce tomb, but also we should note, in addition to St. Margaret, P, possibly two elite graves, that one at least a female, possibly moved to the south transept into the new Bruce of Elgin crypt for the new church. He also marks us as a big box in what would be the new uh, north entrance way, though the site of those six traditional stones, the slabs, uh, and a couple of other features, including, probably can't see it, way at the back, it's marked as M. This is a box which they find in the course of clearing. It has a heart in it, a preserved heart. So you'll know the tradition of royal heart burial. You remove the heart, bury it in a different church. That means you can have masses said for your soul at more than one location. Uh, Bruce, of course, sends his heart on pilgrimage, crusade, and it's supposed to be returned to Melrose. Other kings may have separated off their hearts. Alexander II is buried at Melrose. This is his, for example. That will be reinterred with Bruce's remains come 5th of November, 1819. So an incredibly important plan. Uh, and one I'll come back to in my lecture on the radar scans, because in effect, what we ended up doing for a lot of our work was testing that plan. How accurate was it? The reason why I began to doubt Byrne, however, was that at least one of his working or provisional plans suggested that to establish a good foundation, kind of base pylons on which to build beautiful but very large structure on a difficult site, he would have to build through some of these medieval features. So two of his pylons, at least, and our radar work confirms this, blast right through the, the six slabs, and at least potentially through or underneath the Bruce II as it's rebuilt for 1819. So that's important to bear in mind. Had he, in fact, taken away more medieval features that were there, but were simply not recorded and spoken about in 1818, 1819. I think you can begin to feel a bit of sympathy for Byrne, uh, particularly when you realize uh, the other kind of strong characters are in and around Unfermline at this time. He probably gets caught between the tension between the Kirk Session and Elgar for various issues that we'll look into. And the tensions between the Kirk Session and the Lords Barons of Exchequer. He has to satisfy all of these masters. And there are other people, not least Provost Major David Wilson, like Elgin, a high Tory, uh, but a member of a dissenting church. He's not actually a congregant within the Abbey Church. That doesn't stop him breaking in on at least two occasions in 18, 1819 to ring the bells when he thinks they should be rung at important civic occasions. He's got an on-running spat with the Kirk Session about that. Uh, it's Elgin and Wilson who kind of headline another ceremony on the 10th of March, 1818, when the foundation stone is laid for this great new Abbey Church. It's something of a Masonic event. Elgin and the Heritors processing through the town with the councillors, Kirk Session members, and reportedly as many as eight to 10,000 people. It's almost all of the parish, if you like. Uh, Elgin has brought two important relics, the sword and helmet of Bruce, which Burns had engaged with, and they process to the site, the stone is laid, various objects are interred with the stone, I'll, I'll come back to that. Speeches are given, uh, Scots Wahe is sung, Burns's great song about Bruce's address to his troops at Bannockburn. Wilson, however, quite quickly publicly utters worries about the mob, worries about the population at large hijacking Bruce and his great reputation and suggests that the grave should be guarded not by the local constable, one poor individual, uh, but by the militia. Perhaps some of his own self-interest there, but he clearly worries about how people are gonna to react to and use the discovery of Bruce's bones. He's maybe reacting to the fact that by then, the spring of 1818, what to do with the bones has already in a sense been taken out of the Kirk Session inheritors control and the townspeople's control. It's been passed by Viscount Sidmouth, Secretary of State, really to the Lord High Chief Commissioner, uh, Chief Justice Officer uh, in Scotland, Sir William Adam of Blair Adam, just up the road beyond Kinross, uh, a Baron of Exchequer. He's been given responsibility about how he remains. In fact, he's already been to visit uh, before the Bruce Bones discovery in that capacity. He's come with Jardin to, to look for other royal remains because the Kirk Session has already asked about the possibility of if they do find royal remains, 
about removing them all, lifting and removing them all to a site just next to Margaret's remaining marble plinth for her fair tree shine, with, as they put it, the greatest possible decency and respect. So they want to move them. Hence, Adam and Jordan have come to have a look. Now, there might be something of a conflict of interest here. Adam is also a heritor of Dunfermline Abbey Parish, albeit for some quite minor lands. He attends church in Kinross, uh, but he is a heritor here. He's also perhaps already found himself on the opposing side of a number of personal and political confrontations with Elgin. He's a good friend, for example, of Robert Ferguson of Wraith, who's the man named in Elgin's divorce proceedings. And they clearly clash over things like general elections, the selection of MP candidates for the rotating Stirling Dunfermline Kirkcaldy Borough uh, MP seat, uh, one of the notoriously corrupt boroughs of Scotland, which is usually bought for the expenditure of at least 100,000 pounds when each election comes round. The election, incidentally, will fall in the summer of 1818. And in the summer following that, there'll be a public inquiry into these electoral practices and the status of borough politics, corrupt borough practices in Scotland, including Dunfermline, uh, to which Wilson will give evidence. There's lots going on. Adam may therefore have something of a, a conflict of interest, but he weighs right in. And in response to the appeals from the Kirk Session and from Elgin, he orders Bruce's tomb to be covered, chained, and guarded. He prevents them or denies them the right to move any more royal remains. Uh, and he tells Elgin, no, we won't stop the building process. We'll, we'll carry on. So he passes right through Elgin's wishes. Albeit he does promise that all royal remains will be within the walls of the new Abbey Church. Now, come the completion of the building in 1822, you could say he stuck to that promise, bar one, and that's St. Margaret. Uh, I don't think there was necessarily too much tension about that, but th that's in a sense a different issue. How do you, as a new Presbyterian church, embrace the remains of a Catholic ferretry shrine? It's a, it's a difficult question. Now, it would be quite easy, just as with Elgin, as I say, to be quite cynical about Adam, but I think for him too, we have to take a step back. He's a complex man. He's got interest in many things, and he's clearly quite an avid antiquarian as well. This is something that really requires a, a, a great modern novelist. I wish Beryl Bainbridge was still with us. She would do this kind of thing brilliantly well. Maybe James Robertson will take it up. Uh, if I had the nerve, I'd try it myself. Adam oversees this time something which gets labeled as the Blair Adam Club, a monthly meeting of his lawyerly and social circle friends, mostly from Edinburgh, uh, at his house, Blair Adam, and they go and visit a historic site. They also seem to do a lot of drinking uh, and other things, perhaps, but they also go to church and discuss political matters. It's something of a talking shop, uh, and the participants are worthy of note. Adam himself and his son, who's captain of the Royal Yacht, Walter Scott, uh, lawyer and novelist. Captain Adam Ferguson, Scott's great friend. Uh, Sir Samuel Shepherd, an English justice, sent north in 1817 by Sidmouth and Liverpool to really advise on sedition trials in Edinburgh, to give an English legal perspective, and who stays, and whom I'll, we'll encounter again. Other luminaries more or less involved in things like the clerk register's office. Thomas Thompson, for example, who just edited and published the Acts of the Parliaments of Scotland, is working on the Royal Acts of Scotland as publication, including Robert Bruce's charters. Uh, artists, medical men, including James Gregory, who will be here for the interment ceremony in November uh, 1819. So a remarkable group. And it's probable that they do go to Dunfermline between the discovery and the reinterment, although there's a gap in Adam's records much of this he writes up in a book he publishes in 1834 called Remarks on the Blair Adam Estate, which the Carnegie Library holds a copy of. Wonderful, wonderful book, but supported by many other papers in the Blair Adam archive as well. This is the group which more and more will seek to, I think, control what happens with Bruce's remains for various reasons, which I, I hope to draw out for you. But if we're dealing with politics and antiquarian 
antiquarianism, there's one other character to bring in, and that's the Deputy Royal Remembrance, Sir Henry Jardin, the man who oversees the ceremony here in November 1819. Uh, quite an enigmatic figure, possibly the one who, who has the most negative image. Again, thanks to Scott, uh, we should note. Scott, in his journal, quite bluntly describes him as a vain man and a jobber. He always poaches somewhat by getting some little management or other in any scheme that may be going for the public good and for which he may decently handle a little cash. It's fairly damning words. Uh, maybe we shouldn't push that too far. The two actually become friends later on. So let's hope Jarvan never read the journal. Uh, through things like the Bannatyne Club publishing historical papers and the Society of Antiquaries. Uh, and Scott undoubtedly knows and responds to Jardin's report of the reinterment and the description of the burial as found. Scott himself won't make it to Dunfermline until 1822 privately, and I'll, I'll come back to that. I think, though, Jardin's ambitions clearly are at play here, but we should note that he covets a knighthood almost as much as Scott does. Uh, Jardin and Scott will both get that, and Jardin will also get the job of fool royal remembrancer by 1821, perhaps as a result of the work he does here, that it's looked on favorably by government. We should note that Scott himself is perhaps responsible, guilty if you like, of showing Jarvan the value and importance of controlling commemoration and public interaction with these kind of historic figures and remains. The classic North British Tory, very often, well, that's how we think of him, a man who reluctantly keeps away from fictionalizing Robert Bruce. He'd rather let folk read John Barber's great 14th century poem. He only does it later in his life, 1820s, and then quite lightly. He leaves Bruce alone in some senses. But we know from his journal and other writings that he is at times worried that figures like Wallace and Bruce can be used as sort of icons of both working class, ordinary subjects' rebellion against authority, but also anti-English rhetoric something he's clearly keen to guard on. This is why he threatens to blow up the Earl of Buchan's uh, statue to Wallace at Driver, which frowns across the border. Uh, so he'll go that far, it would seem. And it's Scott that oversees, and this is, I think, crucially important, just two weeks before the discovery of Bruce's remains, 4th of February, 1818, a very choreographed ceremony. He knows they're there, but he, Adam, Jardin, and various royal figures enter a room in Edinburgh Castle to rediscover the Scottish crown jewels, and they'll go on public display, but in a very controlled way. It's a shilling a ticket. So by 1822, in the time of George IV's visit, only about 30,000 middle-class Edinburghers and Scots have visited. The public at large doesn't really get to see them. And the prints which are sold and have become, in their own right, quite famous, uh, are part of that process, just as is the guardian, the man appointed to overlook this visitor attraction, Captain Ferguson, is that Blair Adam Club member and Scott's great personal friend. So it's a close, tight circle overseeing this. They don't want the crown jewels used in any way to upset the balance of union. And indeed, there's correspondence showing that they're, they're reassuring Sidmouth and others in government in London that that's going to be the case. Now, I think in that context, discovery of Bruce's bones in Dunfermline in 1818, in what's going to be a Presbyterian church, a public space, a very democratic space, you could say, gets the authorities worried, people like Adam and Scott above all. Are they more worried because it's Dunfermline? Perhaps. Uh, at that stage, Dunfermline is, of course, a town in terms of its industry dominated by weaving and in the surrounding area by weaving and mining. Uh, the kind of trade makeup that very often lends itself to labor organization and agitation. Think of Paisley, Glasgow, Stirling, Bannockburn, and so on. Uh, the town has, in the late 18th century, a history of radical organization. There are branches of Friends of the People, United Scotsmen, in Dunfermline. And as late as 1817, so just the year before the discovery, Henderson will record that there's a mass agitated rally of workers held just outside Dunfermline attended by people from Kirkcaldy, Stirling, and elsewhere. So this is clearly something of a worry at that time. There's a radical atmosphere, uh, which will continue on into the 1820s and 30s. 
Andrew Carnegie's uncle is very much involved in that kind of chartist period agitation. You can read about that uh, and project it backwards. I think there were worries about Dunfermline blowing up in the same way as somewhere like Stirling or Paisley might have blown up. For a Whig like Adam, sort of moderate liberal, who's keen on reform, and Tories like Elgin and Scott, uh, that kind of brings them together. They have a growing fear that the legacy of the French Revolution above all might be corrupted, and that even quite respectable middle class and skilled working class elements pushing for reform might force things to go too far, too fast, and with violent consequences. Hence, these kind of political authority figures are interested in slowing it down, keeping a lid on agitation, making sure there's enough of a militia around to deal with any trouble. And of course, in a post-Napoleonic war context, it ends in 1815, you get the kind of economic conditions that might light the tinder to this problem. Uh, wages fall, prices and unemployment go up, and there's the perpetual specter of technological advances in weaving, which might see a good many men and women thrown onto the unemployment heap. So there's a real sense that this is a worry, I think, more so in towns like Dunfermline, Stirling, Paisley and elsewhere uh, at this period. Now, some of that we can trace for Dunfermline in a literary way. The infamous Black Dwarf, London-based radical paper formed in 1817, quick, quickly picks up on the Bruce Bones discovery and has poems and rival cartoons and editorials about invoking Bruce as a radical icon against things like Sidmouth and slavery, uh, complaining about corrupt Tory borough practices and MPs buying the electoral seat and so on. There's reports in the Fife County Council that this infamous tract is showing up in the pockets of, of otherwise innocent Dunfermline weavers uh, by 1819, alongside copies of Payne's Age of Reason and other incendiary tracts. Now, the moderates come up with their own literary response. The Blackwoods magazine of, in Edinburgh, founded at roughly the same time, you can see how much longer it runs. Its response is to run a poetry competition asking for the best poetic dialogue between Wallace and Bruce at Carron Shore just after the Battle of Falkirk, an incident made famous in Blind Harry's The Wallace poem, still popular uh, in publication. The winner is a suitably bland poem uh, by, by an English woman uh, praising Wallace and Bruce as heroes of union. They keep Scotland and England apart until they're ready for union in 1707 and the fruits of empire. So exactly what kind of line Scott would have liked to have been taken, you have to think. Now, that, that, at one level, that's quite humorous, but of course there are real world consequences and applications. And I think for someone like Adam, Scott and others, involved with the militias as they are, Adam is Lord Chief, uh, Lord Lieutenant of Kinrosha, for example, uh, there are two incidents either side of the Bruce Re internment in November 1819, which seemed to confirm their fears. The first, of course, is from the summer of that year, the Peterloo Massacre, recently rendered into film uh, so well. The second is in early 1820, the Cato Street Conspiracy, a plot to kill the Prime Minister. This comes just a, a few days after the death of George III. So there's really quite a lot of tension in the air. And I think we have to try and understand the Bruce Rhee internment in, in that context as well. There may be more of a threat, I think, than we generally tend to acknowledge from this kind of undercurrent of tension and, and radical agitation in Scotland. We tend to dismiss it because in the end we know that nothing really happens. But at the time, I think it's much more present and historical figures and relics, and the Bruce's bones fall into that category, the, the timing couldn't be better in a sense. They're crucial, they're, they're a main part of it. If I can, let me take you back just a wee bit in time to 1814. So this is the Borestone, the raising of the standard site just outside Stirling where Bruce raises, starts his campaign at Bannockburn. It's become a site of pilgrimage, but also of political rallies by 1814. A great crowd, again, of about eight to 10,000 people is reported here for the anniversary, 24th of June, 1814. And radical rallies continue, thousands of people in the years that follow, gathering here. Scots Wahey uh, is regularly sung. Weavers and miners of Stirling and Bannockburn, very similar in makeup, you could say to Dunfermline, regularly gather. And there's fears expressed 
by the local militia commander and the garrison in Stirling Castle of arms being stockpiled in Bannockburn and in Stirling. The Black Dwarf is circulating amongst the men and there's fears that even some members of the militia may have been infected and that indeed turns out to be true as we'll see. By 1818 and the years we're concerned with, uh, labor organizations from Paisley and Glasgow, the great weaving and industrial heartlands of agitation in the West, are sending delegations to meetings in Stirling and on to Kirkcaldy and Dunfermline. Now, all of this comes to a head in the spring of 1820, Scotland's so-called radical war. So yes, but a few months after the reinterment ceremony, but I think this is important and relevant. A small band of workers marching on the Carron Ironworks, so Carron Shore, the scene of that great Wallace Bruce meeting uh, from Blind Harry and other historical sources. But they're cut off at Bonnie Muir on the 5th of April by force of militia horsemen. It's a bit of a damp squib, uh, but their leaders are rounded up. Two of them, Baird and Hardy, are put on trial in Stirling, where Sheriff Ronald MacDonald condemns them. They are hung and beheaded. Quite graphic punishment for their treason. Others who are accused and condemned, and indeed they're, they're arraigned on the 24th of June, 1820, Bannockburn Day. MacDonald doesn't miss a trick. Uh, they are all transported uh, to Australia. So something of a damp squib, but I think what we've maybe missed is that the workers are trying to use historic associations to build up their support and the, the impact of what they're trying to do. 5th of April, 1820 is Bonnie Muir. It's the day before the 500th anniversary of the Declaration of Arbroath, which has just been republished in a radical press in Glasgow. And that radical press is just a few doors away from the press that produces the so-called address to the inhabitants of Great Britain and Ireland, calling for them, calling for the workers to take up arms and strike back against their employers, authorities about prices and wages and electoral corruption. So there's an awareness of a, an iconic Bruce Association. I wonder if this may even be in part in response to what happens here on the 5th of November, 1819. Certainly the authorities in Stirling keep hammering away about the importance of controlling historic associations with Bruce and Wallace as well. So they form something called the Stirling and Bannockburn Caledonian Association, which makes sure that at every Bannockburn anniversary, they send a delegation, a procession of town worthies, respectable men, to the Borestone, preventing any other bodies from rallying there, it would seem. They make no speeches, they lay a wreath, uh, they perhaps sing Scots Wahey, but then they withdraw to the much more respectable middle-class suburb of the King's Park, for Highland games, Highland dancing, school bursaries and prizes. Uh, they really control it and make sure it's nice and calm. Uh, and there's no real look in for more of the agitative elements. It's interesting that this society, uh, its chieftain is Ronald McDonald, the very sheriff who condemns Baird and Hardy. Made up alongside the Lord Lieutenant, captain of the garrison, the bank manager, the councillor, uh, Walter Scott is even named as one of its honorary chieftains, although it turns out no one's told him. Uh, he makes no mention of this society. It's interesting, though, that MacDonald had also been advised in his legal judgment by Sir Samuel Shepherd, that member of the Blair Adam Group, the English justice official sent north to advise on sedition. Uh, so his presence has already been felt in that regard. Now, Scott, although he's not involved with that group, also maybe takes lessons from this. And when George IV visits in 1822, uh, as I think probably John Preble has shown us the best effect, he choreographs the royal visit in a very careful, loyal, and romanticized historical way. Scottish history is not a threat. It's not about being anti-English. It's about taking part in the Union and Empire. Uh, it's very much, the, the, if you like, the moment when Tartan is born and the Highland image of Scotland is born, at least for the, the population at large, it's a, a, a statement of loyalty, if nothing else. And it's striking, certainly I find it striking, that although George IV is there, he doesn't visit Bannockburn, and he doesn't visit Dunfermline. You'd think he would, 
given what's most recently happened. But he doesn't. He just stays in and around Edinburgh. This is Scott keeping him away from what's otherwise a difficult place for him to visit. Scott himself, we know, goes to Dunfermline in 1822. That's the wonderful moment when he's gifted panelling from the former lofts in the nave, which has now been stripped and the process of restoring it, as Elgin had hoped, to its medieval uh, original state has taken place. He's given panelling which goes into his study at Abbotsford. He's also given a cast of the Bruce skull, uh, which he clearly treasures. Now, I think we have to be aware of that kind of context for 5th of November 1819 uh, and the reinterment of Bruce's bones and not some of the, the other reasons that are often given as to why the ceremony takes the form and timing it does. It's not so much about propriety, about doing the right thing by the crown, although that might be a small part. Uh, George III has long been ill, so getting involved in what, we, what might be perceived as a kind of ghoulish investigation of royal remains is something to be careful about. The death of Queen Caroline, Princess Caroline, sorry, uh, and royal mourning for months, months and months through 1817-18 has also made people sensitive to this. And certainly when they dug up poor old Edward I in 1774, antiquarians were rounded on as ghouls. How dare they do this? How dare they desecrate these Christian burials? Uh, there's a similar reaction when Charles I's tomb at Windsor is investigated in 1813. So you have to be careful about this. There may be other practical reasons as well. The southern Elgin crypt, which becomes a bone of contention between Elgin and the Kirk, Kirk session, has flooded. He's created something of a sump unwittingly. I think it still has some of those issues today. There is a natural water course, I think, down this axis of the church, as well as a burn that used to run down the uh, east side, and a, an old fish pond, medieval fish pond in the northwest corner. This has a problem with water. That has flooded, causing tension with the heritors and poor old William Byrne, who has to step in. Uh, there may have been a desire to miss other important events, the election, general election, the summer of 1818, that government inquiry in 1890, when poor old Wilson has to give evidence uh, about corrupt borough practices. And it emerges that the borough is hugely in debt, 20,000 pounds, more than they thought. Uh, and he's clearly been guilty of blocking the craft guilds and other more Whiggish elements in the town from having representation. We should note this doesn't stop him being returned as provost throughout all of these years until 1822. He's clearly very popular in the borough. There may be also a desire to miss anniversaries like Bannockburn, Waterloo, St Andrew's Day. And the date they in the end go for, it, I think we have to think carefully about why have they chosen this. Is it just practical? Do they know that's when they can all assemble uh, these dignitaries? Uh, do they think it's going to be quiet? Are they hopeful that Elgin won't be there? And he does seem to be off in Paris. Part of his way of escaping his own debts is to live in Paris where it's cheaper. I think, though, that there may be a more deliberate choice going on here. And some of the correspondence between Adam, Jordan, Sidmouth, and Shepherd certainly seem to speak to this. 5th of November, of course, is Guy Fawkes Day, Guy Fawkes Night which right up until 1859 is perhaps a much more anti-Catholic public celebration uh, than we are aware of now. Uh, it would see bonfires lit in the forenoon, early in the day, and maintained by the town. It would go around collecting coal and wood uh, to keep them going. Very often, just like celebrations on the king's birthday, there are reports that the towns like, townspeople like to gather at the end, west end of Bridge Street and fire off pistols and cannons at a point that's just beyond the edge of the borough jurisdiction so they don't get into trouble. Uh, do the dignitaries who assemble think, well, they're going to be distracted. We can do this in private, as seems to be their initial intention, possibly so. It is, though, and this is where I think this question of making a Protestant statement of loyalty and trying to control the discovery of what might be taken as an anti-English icon, Bruce, uh, well in hand. It's a double celebration the 5th of November in this day and age. It's also the anniversary of the Hanoverian landings at Brixham in 1689. And this is very much marked in church sermons and public declarations at this time. There's always a borough council procession to mark this rather than Guy Fawkes Day. Uh, these take place with almost comic regularity, led by Wilson, uh, a lot of drinking, 
uh, a lot of royal, loyal toasts. And indeed, we know the toast that year includes Bruce and Wallace, Napoleon, uh, Nelson, uh, Trafalgar, Fannickburn, all mixed together as a kind of pro-union statement. Now, I don't want to push that too far. The town has, after all, been told they had to wait to perform an interment ceremony until the walls of the new Abbey Church were at least seven feet high. And whether by design or accident, this is about the point at which they reach that height, uh, just as those four windows of the Lady Chapel are about to be removed. Uh, so there's maybe a practical reason as to why this is going to go ahead, and we end up with these wonderful drawings and that report by Jardin of what they see and the ceremony itself. What Jardin doesn't give you a lot of detail about, however, and this, for this you have to turn to sources like Henderson's Annals of Dunfermline, Chalmers' Later History, Statistical Account, and other sources, is the degree to which, a bit like what went on in Stirling and what goes on with George IV's visit, there's choreography at work. Adam is not present. He reports himself ill and unable to come. And he's cancelled visits throughout 1818, 19. Uh, this may be true, or he's maybe avoiding difficult political circumstances. Scott doesn't come. He won't come until 1822. One of the letters in the Blair Adam archive suggests he doesn't want to come to this big public event because he's worried about what he seems to call tomfoolery. Uh, I wonder if what he's wondering, worrying about there is Wilson, who's quite a maverick character, but also uh, Dr. James Gregory, royal physician, professor from Edinburgh, who does seem to design a lot of what goes on. There's a letter from him to Adam talking about how he'd wished he'd been able to come with Adam earlier to see the Bruce tomb in the Abbey, uh, and then to go and visit a body house and get drunk. So there's maybe a bit of worry that this is not altogether going to be a savoury occasion for people like Scott and Adam. They're not there. Neither is Elgin, probably off in Paris, but we know by this point that he's fallen out with the Kirk Session over the flood. Kirk Session recalls, recalls that he said he never again wishes to take any concern in the business of your late meetings. Pretty final and fi uh, uh, emphatic, although he will be back by August of 1821 when the important issue of church pews in the new Abbey Church begins to be discussed. He's also by that stage, however, fallen out spectacularly with Adam in the county council over an issue about something called rogue money, which is money you pay to the militia and the constables to deal with vagrants. So again, an issue of public law and order and control. Uh, just who was going to be funding this has proven a difficult issue for them. So in comes this group of really Edinburgh dignitaries to represent the barons of Exchequer and Adam and Elgin and Scott, headed really by Samuel Shepherd, who's now chief baron of the Exchequer, as well as continuing his justice role. Uh, an MP, not the Ranald MacDonald who was the judge in Stirling, one of his cousins, who's an MP, uh, might seem slightly random, he certainly takes away a relic of the Bruce tomb. Other medicos like Alexander Munro, who inspects and measures the skull. Uh, other members of the Blair Adam group, like Clark and Ferguson, perhaps delegating for Scott and Adam themselves. They're joined by Dunfermline dignitaries, Wilson, town council, uh, some of the other heritors. We should note, as well as the Dunfermline Abbey Church ministers of first and second charge, the dissenting ministers. So this idea that it's a totally exclusive private occasion, we shouldn't push too far. They are there. Uh, and I'm grateful to my colleague David Bebbington, who's the great historian of evangelical history, pointing that out. That's quite unusual, he thought, for all the dissenting ministers to be, to be allowed to be there. What we also know, though, is that as much as this group might have hoped to inspect the remains quite privately, to then record them, draw them, take a cast of the skull, uh, and so on, the locals will not be denied. They've obviously gotten wind that it's happening, and because the walls are as low as they are, they gather, perhaps climbing on top. You can well imagine boys and girls of the town doing that, banging at the southern door to be let in, and Gregory admits them. And as he describes it, he's quite quick to rush out with his own account for at least an hour, if not longer, the townspeople mill past, south to north, past the tomb. The skeleton is reportedly put on display, I, think, I wonder if on the sort of Masonic funeral board. The skull, the skull at one point is reportedly detached and held up. 
silencing the crowd. And that satisfies them. They leave. And a private ceremony resumes. Once that's done, there are some speeches. Uh, Wilson emphasizing Bruce's contribution to Scottish independence, Scotland's great hero king. That perhaps makes Shepherd a bit nervous, and his speech is very much more about Union and Wallace and Bruce as heroes that even Englishmen can celebrate now that it has led to Union and Empire. So very much a statement of loyalty. That they're a wee bit worried about how the locals are reacting and how Wilson is leading them in reaction is suggested by the fact that just a, a week later, 12th of November, when the county council gathers, Adam's probably there, but not Elgin, they issue a statement of loyalty, a formal statement of loyalty to George III, which they, they send to the Crown, emphasizing the importance of their recent attempts to do away with those who would attempt to poison the minds of the lower orders. So they're clearly still worried about what's going on in terms of radical organization in and around Dunfermline. Now, the casting of the skull will lead to phrenological discussions. George Coombe, above all, will write a great essay about reading Bruce's character, his bravery, his valor, his piety, etc., into his skull. Quite controversial by the late Victorian period, uh, but popular in its day. And we know, too, that the moment of the display of the Bruce remains and perhaps townspeople filing past is when many small relics, souvenirs, are, are removed. I have to say, though, that the, the official dignitaries are perhaps more light-fingered than the locals. Uh, most of these objects tend to turn up in aristocratic collections, medical and dental hospitals in Edinburgh, and so on. Uh, I've published a wee bit about it, and Martin McGregor's also managed to assemble yet more of these relics. Cloth of gold, nails, bits of oak, uh, teeth, finger bones, and so on. So clearly this is people very anxious to take away a relic of Robert the Bruce at this time. We should, though, note that that happens just before uh, an important part of the, the reinterment ceremony that I don't want to just brush past. Uh, objects are to be placed in Bruce's new lead coffin, uh, which will be placed inside a new brick-lined crypt space uh, in the site of the original uh, medieval discovery. And these include a copy of Barber's The Bruce, Kerr's biography of Robert the Bruce, Fernie's history of Dunfermline, uh, gazetteers of Edinburgh, Edinburgh newspapers, and coins of George III. And they also put in for good measure that heart, medieval embalmed heart that they found just a few feet to the northeast. Uh, now that might seem as a very sort of Edinburgh way of taking control of things, but we shouldn't push that too far either. Elgin had done something similar at the laying of the foundation stone. He'd put in Edinburgh newspapers, coins, and a list of the chief heritors, those that had 100 pounds or more of land. So he was at the top, and just a few select men followed. Uh, it's worthy of note that Dunfermline itself does not have its own newspaper until the 1830s. So they had to rely on Edinburgh newspapers for their news. Uh, they may have had cheap penny broadsheets circulating, but for a newspaper, it had to come from Edinburgh. But I think the interment of books reflects the popularity of reading and of historical reading in Dunfermline. Uh, the Tradesman's Library, which had been established in the late 18th century, which by 1819 is reported to have at least 300 volumes and a vast local readership. I think that's a reflection of their interest. So it need not be seen purely as an Edinburgh imprint on a Dunfermline festival. The reason I raise that is that some do read into that resentment from the locals about the degree to which the Edinburgh authorities had taken over. Uh, and the usual sign of that is that apparently five days later, a nameplate turns up in the debris field around the Bruce tomb, uh, seeming to indicate it as the site of Robert's burial, which some years later is revealed to have been a fake. Jardin buys this, gives it to the Society of Antiquaries, and it works its way into the royal collection. Uh, but it's revealed to be a fake within a few years. Perpetrated, depending on which report you believe, either by Burns head builder, John Bonner, along with an artist uh, and a local publican, or by a similar group, including a local historian, Andrew Merson. That's really interesting, because he publishes a history of Dunfermline in 1828, and he says some very interesting things about the earlier antiquarian studies and remains. Uh, 
I don't think, though, that that reflects any strong circulating doubts in Dunfermline about the identity of the body they'd found. Don't think that's what they're trying to get at. They report their motives as being partly to prick the vanity of those who want to be involved in the ceremony attached with Bruce, or they may have commercial interests at heart, just trying to, to whip up tourism, early tourism, if you like. It's an odd one, though, uh, whether it speaks, as some have suggested, to resentment of Edinburgh's role and Edinburgh's leadership in this, it's not entirely clear. Wilson certainly is nervous about the degree to which he may have upset the authorities, and some of his letters in the last couple of years of his life has provost, uh, particularly when he's reporting more finds of marble, probably from Bruce's tomb or a similar tomb, again in the debris field and around the church as it's completed. Uh, this adds to the numerous pieces found between 1807 and 1817. He's quite effusive in trying to persuade Adam that I'm loyal. We're doing what you want, and we're not pushing on this issue of asking you for more money for a suitable tomb marker for Bruce and the other kings. Don't forget that was Adam's promise uh, as the church went up according to his timetable. Now, once the church is finished, there's no sign of Adam or the Lord's Baron or anyone else in authority stepping in to, to mark the tombs as they had promised from government's perspective. And it falls to the heritors to in some way commemorate. First of all, they produce uh, the balustrade naming of Robert the Bruce. And they do begin to talk about a suitable monument. People like Gregory produce potential inscriptions that might go on this new tomb marker. But by as late as 1845, they still don't have one, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, Patrick Chalmers certainly laments the absence of a marker for Bruce's and the other royals, the other six kings and several queens and royal family members, guardians like Randolph and Murray. They don't have markers. And local artist who's become very much a history painter uh, and designer of monuments, Joseph Noel Payton, whose father keeps a museum of artifacts, including many objects attached to Bruce, comes up with this design, which I'm sure you can agree had it been produced uh, by public subscription and heritor donation would have been superb, uh, if a little controversial in a Presbyterian church. It doesn't in the end get taken up, just as Neither do Peyton's designs for Edinburgh, where he proposes a great monument for Wallace and Bruce, or for the Wallace Monument. He, of course, proposes uh, an allegoric statue of a lion defeating Typhon, uh, which is very much taken as an anti-English sentiment. Now, again, we shouldn't push this too far. This is not yet the great age of monument mania. That's the second half of the 19th century, when it became acceptable and useful to put up monuments to historic figures. In the first half, they're rather more interested in commemorating contemporary figures, contemporary heroes of union, particularly military figures. Think of the, the Westminster uh, mausoleum for great imperial figures. And it's not really until post-1850 that people show a real active interest in putting up historical commemorative monuments. It falls then to the Eighth Earl in 1889 to produce the bronze plaque which we see today, which is as a scene of pilgrimage today. So it's, again, a heritor donation. The state has still not agreed to step in. But by then, I think we're well into the age of civic commemoration of historic figures. This is our growth where, from the late 19th century, and particularly in the 20th century, the 6th of April anniversary of the declaration of our growth and the pageant involving Bruce is a hugely popular public occasion. At the Borestone near Stirling, uh, grows as a site of pilgrimage and of political rallies, we should note. The Home Rule Movement, early SNP, uh, certainly congregates here around about 24th of June, really right up until late 20th century. Uh, that will make the authorities there, again, quite nervous. Uh, in 1914, there are reports of the town council making sure the town band is sent along on the anniversary date to play Scots Wahey so loud that none of the political figures who've gone there to make speeches can be heard. Meanwhile, the town council and the dignitaries are having their usual jamboree in the King's Park. Uh, so they're still trying to control it. But I think by then, it's not really perceived as a political threat. It's taken quite lightheartedly. And it's really about pageantry and civic pride. In that context, by 1929, Edinburgh, from 
can, can finally relax and take the politics out of things, it gets its long-awaited Wallace and Bruce statues. And that's the same year, of course, as I'm sure many of you know, of a great celebration here to mark the 600th anniversary of Bruce's death and burial, uh, which sees royal participation and great figures like Haig coming to the town on that day. I'm quite keen to look at that as one of my, my next projects. Now, that kind of provides a, 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 a long tail sequel, as it were, to events in 18, 18, 1819, which I think, hopefully, I've managed to show you, are a microcosm of what's going on in Scotland at that time. Worries about working class and middle class agitation for reform means that figures like Wallace and Bruce and these kind of antiquarian discoveries and what you do with them and the role of the state in either paying for them or acting as custodians of them is quite difficult to navigate. And in the end, perhaps certainly to our modern eyes, what, what emerges at Dunfermline is, yes, reflective of local pride and a genuine local interest, but of quite a degree of nervousness on the part of the authorities. They don't really know how to handle it, and their attempts to do so don't always go as planned. Uh, work that I know has been done on commemoration of Robert Burns by Chris Watley at Dundee University brilliantly shows you how it doesn't matter how carefully the authorities plan things, and there you have another radical Republican figure who could be quite, quite incendiary, uh, and they're hoping to control commemoration of his birth and death anniversaries. They can't do it because people read into these heroes and their relics and their sites of association what they want. It is very difficult to attempt to control that. But I think for me as a medieval historian, just to, to wrap up today and to, if I dare, trailer my next lecture, which is the fourth one in the sequence, uh, when I'm going to come back and talk about my radar surveys, I think for me, the really important stuff to come out of the 1818-19 events is the antiquarian evidence and the local knowledge, much of it conflicting about just what remains are there. Above all, Burns' plan and the remains found not just the Bruce tomb but the others and what unexpectedly transpires and their treatment and the other bits and pieces that we can begin to, to put together. Uh, as one of my students put it, here you've got the remains of a hugely complex monastic church, a royal foundation, a debris field, a thousand meters squared. And the only remains that we can definitely identify from the six kings, several queens, large extended family and ecclesiastical burials that we have to assume went on here, plus early modern town burials that we just don't know about in many cases. The only remains that we can definitely identify are Robert the Bruce's. And the only tomb from which we find fragments are Robert the Bruce's. What are the odds on that? Uh, now, the student attempted to tell me it was 40 or 50 to 1. They counted up graves. Uh, it may be higher than that. I think that it's just a cautionary way of saying, if this were any other church and this were any other king, historians and archaeologists would be very cautious about saying, oh, it must be him, and only focusing on that. And what I'm keen to do, and I'll come back and talk about this, is to try and recreate the church as a living whole. So not just to focus on that one grave, but to think about all the others, all the other altars in a Trinity church with three royal saints, and how the space worked, how the architecture developed, how the liturgy was performed within it. Uh, now to do that, I'm going to ask questions like, you know, was there, wasn't there more there in 1818? Are we only hearing the highlights, the stuff that really excited them? And they were genuinely excited. Some of the antiquarian evidence that you can find does suggest that there was more uh, in situ to see in 1818, and which locals may have known about and later talk about, even beyond 1822 when the church is finished. And can we combine that often quite contradictory medieval evidence, be it chronicles and records, and that antiquarian evidence with modern non-invasive practices like ground probing radar, so taking a sweep of what might be down at the medieval depth to try and recreate here the same kind of complex architectural liturgy that you see other royal mausoleum. This is another great Benedictine abbey. This is Westminster, the Plantagenet mausoleum, which the Scots are clearly trying to rival in the 13th century and 14th century. 
Uh, but perhaps more appropriate is Saint-Denis, the great French, again, Benedictine, Royal Abbey and Mausolea, just outside Paris. And I think that's perhaps the far more appropriate model to end with, given what you'll hear next week in the second lecture from Dr. Ian Fraser from Historic Environment Scotland. He's the man chiefly responsible for the recreated lost Bruce tomb, and it's the French model. The tombs of Saint-Denis and the French kings arranged as a sort of flotilla of dynastic tombs that he's drawing on. And I'm going to come back and join you for that lecture next week. Thank you very much.